Good afternoon. Welcome to Asia Society Texas Center. My name is Selena Joffrey and I'm the Director of Business and Policy. Our event today is celebrating Gandhi's legacy of nonviolence. We're extremely honored that the launch of Houston's year-long Gandhi sesquicentennial celebrations start today from Asia Society Texas Center. Mahatma Gandhi passed away 70 years ago, yet his teachings carry on today around the world. Later this afternoon, during our panel discussion, we will learn about one of those who was inspired from nonviolent action, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. We will also hear from a filmmaker and local leaders who were inspired by Gandhi and Dr. King to make a difference in their communities and share a message of peace. We would like to acknowledge our generous contributors who help make events like this possible. Asia Society Texas Center Business and Policy Programs are endowed by the Huffington Foundation. Presenting sponsors for Business and Policy Programs are Bank of America, Muffet Blake, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and United Airlines. Generous funding also provided by the Friends of Asia Society Texas Center. We would like to express special gratitude to our Crow presenting institution for this afternoon's event, the Mahatma Gandhi Library Houston. Especially two individuals who have worked with us in bringing this special event to the Houston community, Atul Kotari and Ajit Peralkar. And both of them also serve on the Board of Trustees of the Mahatma Gandhi Library. Before we begin, may I please request you to silence your phone for the duration of the event. You're welcome to take non-flash photos, and I invite you to share them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, hashtag AsiaSocietyTX. To begin our program, I would now like to introduce Dr. Anupam Ray, Consul General of India in Houston. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ray. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So, you know, the 150th anniversary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, it's a big deal for us in, uh, in uh, India. And I'm extremely glad to be here at the Asia Society, which is working with an institution I greatly admire. When I came here, I found that uh, a group of uh, men and women have much in the tradition of Gandhiji who set off not knowing where he would end and ended up liberating India and uh, uh, creating a, a new moral philosophy. I found that, uh, you know, over the generations I found that uh, he's inspired people and there was something about the quest of Mr. Kothari and Mr. Mahajan and the other gentlemen in, in, and ladies in this museum which reminded me of that quest. I mean, they worked tirelessly in propagating his uh, message. They worked tirelessly in making sure that uh, his, uh, what he represented for is communicated to their new home, which is this part of the world. And I really, uh, believe that that is deserving of the highest praise. Please give them a round of applause. You know, there are five great religions in the world. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. The interesting thing is they come from only two places. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, which are the religions of the book, come from the Middle East. And Hinduism and Buddhism come from India. And these five great religions account for, say, about 90% of the, of, of, of the world's population. So India is a home of uh, religion and philosophy as old as time. And it is perhaps, we are also a nation that has endured a lot, you know, gone through ups and downs, good times, bad times, hundreds of years of, of, uh, of, uh, of being, uh, say, exploited, ruled by others, and then like the phoenix each time, like the Greek phoenix rising. And in this magnificent journey, in this historical sweep, we've produced characters like Buddha, like the Emperor Ashoka, like uh, 
Raja Harish Chandra, and many others. Now, Gandhi, or Mahatma as we call him, is one of those characters. When the history of the world will be written, this will be a name that will, you know, that, that will, as Einstein said, the generations to come will scarcely believe that such a man as, as this one ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. And what is his central message? You know, his, he, had a, he had a bhajan. The bhajan, you know, the, a bhajan to those of you who don't know is, uh, is, a, is an Indian uh, hymn. Or, actually, it's not a hymn. It's something you sing in a more informal environment. And, he used, and his favorite bhajan was Vaishnav Jan to Tene Kahiye Jo Peer Padai Jane Re. Now, it's important to understand what in his mind was Vaishnav Jan. And what is Vaishnav Jan? In our concept of Vaishnav Jan, it's untranslatable, but, but it means uh, fairly loosely translated, it would mean a good man, or a, a religious man, or a devout man, or a spiritual man. And he says, Vaishnav Jan to Tene Kahe, that he who is he is a religious man, Pir Parai Janere, who understands the sorrow of others. That is the greatest man in his, uh, uh, in, 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 in his mind. That is the central core of Gandhiji's philosophy in, uh, my t in, in my view. The fact that you have to be able to look at the other person's point of view, accept it, uh, live with it, learn to see it from his uh, uh, point of view, see where the shoe pinches for him, and then, con and, and, and then uh, moderate your conduct accordingly. I think that is what uh, Gandhiji was about. In a sense, he was a modern version. Uh, his uh, bhajan is a modern version of Matthew 5.5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall find fulfillment. And that is what Mahatma Gandhi is also about. You know, we are today, I represent the government of India here. We are on, on our way to becoming a great power. I don't know if we'll be a great power. We'll certainly be a major power. We are today the fastest growing economy in the world. We will, in course of time, become a permanent member of the Security Council. All this will happen. You know, we will become powerful, we will become rich. Nobody can stop us from doing that. But that is not what is going to make us a great nation. What will become, what will make us a great nation is if we follow Gandhiji's talisman. In everything that we do, think of the poorest and the meekest person and see how your, what you do affects that person. When we, When we as a nation remember those who are weak and learn to treat them well, those who are without privilege, those who are born to disadvantage, when we give them dignity, fraternity, when we assure them of paths to progress, that is when we will live up to Gandhiji's expectations. Thank you very much. I wish this event uh, all, success, uh, all success. Thank you again to Mr. Kothari and your co-workers. Thank you to Asia Society for organizing this and have a good evening. How do I start this? Good afternoon. My name is Ajit Paralka. I'm one of the trustees of uh, the Mahatma Gandhi Library. On behalf of the Mahatma Gandhi Library, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. We are delighted that the Honorable Dr. Anupam Ray is here with us today 
to launch the sesquicentennial, the Mahatma Gandhi sesquicentennial celebrations, starting today and going through 12 months through October 2019 next year. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray, for being with us today. And thank you, Asia Society, Texas Center, for hosting this event. This event today launches Houston's year-long Gandhi sesquicentennial celebration, ending in October 2019. Our mission is to celebrate Gandhi's everlasting message of truth, nonviolence, love, and service. Our goal is that the celebration is broad-based and it involves every section of Houston's community. The founding organizations of this uh, initiative are the Gandhi Library, the Mahatma Gandhi Library, the Arya Samaj of Greater Houston, Jain Society of Houston, and also Unity of Houston. So, uh, it's, I think most of you have a program which looks like this, which you were given as you were walking in. This gives you a quick uh, kind of a overview, a glimpse of some of the programs which we have organized between now and next October 2019. I'm going to show you a couple of slides. You can see we have a number of uh, events lined up, starting with today. We have some speech contests, art contest, uh, essay contest. Uh, we have the Walk for Peace coming up on October 15th. We have the um, Thousand Lights of Peace program coming up on October 15th, so rather. And um, we also have the famous uh, Sarod uh, exponent, uh, Mr. Amjad Ali Khan, who is going to be there on October uh, 21st, if I remember right. Um, do I see that over there? Yeah. Um, and that's organized by India, Indo-American Association, so please make it a point to be there. Uh, as you know, he's very world famous and very talented. Um, and you can see we have different programs, and uh, we'd like you to remember one website, which is gandhi150.us, which you see up there. And all the details of the programs are listed over there. So please spread the word. Please tell your friends and family and attend as many programs as you can. Next couple of slides, we're going to acknowledge um, a number of organizations which have worked with us in hosting these events, the ones we just saw, what you're seeing over there right now. So we have 28 organizations which are working with us. Some have already scheduled the, uh, the programs, which you just saw, the 14 programs. And some are still planning them for the, uh, either this year or next year. Um, so you can see there are organizations from different parts of the community. Um, and we want to acknowledge each and every one of them. So thank you very much for uh, participating in this uh, endeavor. Besides these 28 organizations, we are also have been blessed with and fortunate to have uh, 18 advisory board members, and these advisory board members are, you know, community leaders, and they are, uh, they have been really gracious to, you know, provide us uh, wonderful, excellent guidance and support uh, throughout the planning process. And uh, in these two slides, you see them, and you can see they are, uh, you know, from different uh, aspects of uh, the Houston community. Okay, so uh, I've given you a good rundown on the programs we have, the partners we have, and the advisory board we have. So let's talk about how you and your organization can participate in this sesquicentennial celebration. As you know, we're just kicking, our, kicking it off uh, today, but it's going to go throughout next year through October. So we already have s some programs lined up from now until April. So think about it, go back and talk to your organizations and see whether you'd like to host an event, any kind of event. It could be a talk, a speech, a play, 
a dance recital, an exhibition, what have you. So be creative in terms of uh, um, in a kind of coming up with a message which you can share with uh, the Houston community. You know. Gandhi's message, of course. Um, and uh, uh, all the information is available on the website. You can um, hit the uh, join here uh, section of the uh, website, and all the information will be there as how to go about participating in an organization in this uh, endeavor. Um, I'd like to again acknowledge the 28 partnering organization and advisory board members. Could we have a round of applause for all of them? Thank you. And in conclusion, uh, on behalf of the Mahatma Gandhi Library, it is our sincere hope that all the citizens of Houston can join hands to create a community-wide conversation regarding Gandhi's legacy throughout the next 12 months and beyond. We look forward to working with you and your organization in celebrating Gandhi's legacy of peaceful and nonviolent protest as a means to fighting injustice. Thank you again for your participation today in our kickoff event. Now we will move forward to today's program. And today's program is the Celebrating Gandhi's Legacy of Nonviolence. We'll be showing you two segments of the film A Force More Powerful. It's a 1999 documentary that highlights nonviolent resistance across the world. The first segment is about Gan Mr. Mahatma Gandhi and the Salt March. And the second segment is about Martin Luther King and the Civil Disobedience Movement. Both the segments are approximately 20, 25 minutes long. And uh, the documentary is written, produced, and directed by Mr. Steve York. And we are fortunate to have him amidst, amidst, amidst us. And he's going to be one of the panelists. So we're looking forward to the panel discussions. So with that, I turn this over to the AV team. And we're going to start the first segment of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, Salt March. Thank you so much. Of their accomplishments, please see inside your printed program. Anthony Hall has been actively involved in local and state government and civic affairs since the early 1970s. He has served as a state representative in the Texas legislature, has been a member of the Houston City Council, has served as chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County, city attorney and chief administrative officer for the city of Houston. Atul Kotari, serves on the Board of Trustees of the Mahatma Gandhi Library and first became interested in Mahatma Gandhi about 15 years ago. A firm believer of the philosophy of nonviolence, he's now dedicated himself to taking this message to the next generation. Steve York is a veteran filmmaker who has produced documentaries on religious fundamentalism, history and politics, and nonviolent struggles in Europe, Asia, Africa, and North and South America. He's the director and producer of the documentary we just watched, A Force More Powerful. Our moderator is Dr. Carla Braley. She serves as an assistant professor of sociology at Texas Southern University, and most recently became the vice chair of the Texas Democratic Party. Please join me in welcoming our panelists and moderator. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us on the panel. Mr. Katori 
What does Gandhi mean for India and the Indian diaspora? How is it honored in India and abroad today? Uh, before I say anything, I first would like to thank Almighty for today's event. And most importantly, if you can join me in a very brief prayer, I pray to the God of Sat, truth, to give me the boon of ahimsa, non-violence in mind, word, and deed. Amen. Gandhi remains, in my mind, an eternal influence on Indians anywhere in the world. Uh, he showed the way to settle the conflicts like no one has done in human history before his arrival. So he remains very influential and he impacts all Indians across the globe. And I know you have been, I know you have been very active. How did you get involved with the Gandhi Library in Houston? It was a little bit of an ego problem. I must confess, when I came to the United States in 1974, and as my plane was landing in New York, a certain thought came to my mind that India at one time was the center of the world and people came to India for knowledge, wealth, and everything else. And why this reverse flow had started. And for many years, I stayed on a very simple answer that science and technology is a field developed primarily by the Western world, and we Indians remained worshipping and fell behind. Then about 15 years ago, came another thought to my mind. What is science and technology? Science and technology is nothing else but relentless pursuit of physical truth. So Neil Bohr says atom consists of protons, electrons, and neutrons. And somebody else later on comes in and say there are sub-quark particles. And if, can, if it can be proven, then no matter how popular Neil Bohr is, the new truth is accepted. Then I say, ah, if it is as simple as that, who do I know a practitioner of truth? And I said, he's in our own backyard, Mahatma Gandhi. And when I read his biography, autobiography for the first time in my life, the message went straight to my heart. Uh, and his message is fairly simple. Practice your truth non-violently. And I said, I must do something, whatever I can do a little bit, to spread this message around. Interesting. And like to that, what was the impetus behind the internal Gandhi Museum and how we are now going to have it in Houston. It's selected in Houston. God is kind. <laughs> we were very fortunate. Uh, Rita and I were in 2016 visiting in India. And we've been visiting with the President of General Gandhi for many years. And I was briefly describing to him our simple plans to build a simple Mahatma Gandhi Museum in Houston. And in the middle of my presentation, he stopped me. He said, Atul, would you like to have internal Gandhi Multimedia Museum? And my jaw dropped. <laughs> Say, wow, this is a dream come true. Only thing I said at the time is, I have never raised money in my life. <laughs> so I need to go and speak with the board of trustees. And when I came back, without a moment of hesitation, the board of trustees says, go ahead. What a great initiative. Along with some of the uh, rituals and awareness programs that are happening, could you please explain the 1,000 Lights of Peace and how Houstonians can become more involved? Yeah, it's the annual celebration of the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi, which is October 2nd. And 1,000 Lights of Peace is generally celebrated on Sunday following October 2nd. We are very fortunate, the whole community African-American, Hispanics, Orientals, mainstream America, Indo-American, they come together on this day and they perform a cultural item based on peace and nonviolence. 
This occasion also serves to give awards to the children who have participated in various contests such as essay, speech, poster, multimedia, and so on and so forth. The event is preceded by Walk for Peace. It's a 5K walk where you can come and vote for peace with your feet. And the finale of the event is the lighting of a candle by all present as a pledge to practice peace in their own lives. So this year, it's on October 14th, and we would love every one of you to be there. Well, we look forward to participating in not only that, but many of the other events to come. Mr. York, I think the audience would join me in saying that that is a wonderful piece of work that you have been able to bring to us. What sparked your interest in Gandhi? And what motivated you to work on a force more powerful? It's impossible to think about this whole range of ideas that's wrapped up in the idea of nonviolence without thinking about Gandhi. Uh, it's true that other uh, historians, philosophers, sociologists, had, political scientists had thought about nonviolence before Gandhi, but no one had quite brought it to the fore in the way that he did. And there's been no other influence on later nonviolent movements, such as the one here in the, in the American civil rights struggle. Uh, no one who's had a greater influence than Gandhi, so it's, he's unavoidable. And it's, it's not a difficult choice to, to, to study Gandhi and to learn about Gandhi and to tell stories about Gandhi. It's just unavoidable. Uh, I had, prior to working on this project, done a number of films that looked at major military uh, struggles. The uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, the uh, atomic bombing of, of Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the uh, American invasion of Europe in 1944, known as D-Day, Normandy landings. Um, so I had spent a good deal of time thinking about military conflict and also about the strategies that are involved in military conflict. And one of the things that struck me at a certain point was that nonviolent strategy is pretty similar to violent or, or military strategy. The weapons are different. The weapons are totally different. But strategically, they're very, very similar. They have a great, great many points in common. And, and, and that's a kind of the takeoff point for me, to, to look at, at, at this. And of course, the, the notion of nonviolent struggle waged by people who are underdogs, who don't have access to, to the kinds of resources that large, you know, violent uh, or repressive regimes have. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing because the, the initial sense is, well, of course, it's, it's hopeless. The, the nonviolent uh, protagonist is never going to win in this kind of situation. But if you look at history, they did. They have won many, many times. And so we chose six, of which you saw two today, and we chose six stories in which the, uh, a nonviolent movement prevailed against Pinochet in Chile, against the apartheid government in South Africa, and so forth and so forth, as well as these. Well, in connecting with strategy and being systematic, you once said that Gandhi was driven by principle, and that for a nonviolent movement to succeed, its participants must be disciplined and believed in the just cause of justice. Mm -hmm. When, when you look around at conflicts today, what do you feel that these concepts are lacking? Uh, above all, discipline. I think it's not as um, inspiring, perhaps, as notions of uh, ethical or religious principle, but, but there are an awful lot of movements w whose aims I would agree with entirely, but who march off without any planning without having trained their own activists, uh, and so forth and so forth. All of the things that was, I have not seen these films that, that, that were shown today for, for a number of years, but I was quite struck listening to Jim Lawson describing the fierce discipline and training and all the things you have to do to have a movement, I'm quoting directly, because he's so right. 
and he's as right today as he was 20 years ago when we filmed that interview. Uh, but those, to me, are the things that, that are most lacking in those who would attempt to use nonviolent uh, techniques. And you, you pretty much in, in addressed it. What do you think today is the bis, biggest obstacle related to nonviolent movement? Uh, it's a tough, tough question. To, to, to some degree, I think we just covered that. Um, mostly, though, I would say there is a sense of having to believe that what you're doing can succeed. Um, th the uh, conviction that the use of nonviolent strategy is viable rather than to give up before you start and say, oh, well, you know, my opponent is much too powerful. Uh, this is hopeless. Uh, why should I even try? I think t you, you have to immediately, you, you have to begin by believing in yourself, believing in your cause, and believing that, you, that it is possible to get there. Uh, and then after that, the hard work, the discipline, you know, the training, all of those things. So you said that was a tougher question. I, I think this one may be a little easier, but tough at the same time. <laughs> you so. have documented so many events in which nonviolence was used to overcome powerful social and political elements. Could you tell us which of these events uh, were more memorable and why? Well, they're all memorable. Obviously, it's a bit more difficult um, to get close in the, in the kind of intimate, personal way uh, with an event that occurred before I was born. I mean, what happened in India was over when I was born in 1943. But um, aside from that, uh, the, simply the experience of being in India and of talking to people who had direct personal memory of some of those events was enormously powerful. Um, but I must say, uh, it's difficult to pick out a favorite. Uh, or one that was most powerful in my experience. The best thing about being a filmmaker is that, or a documentary filmmaker at least, is that you get to stick your nose in other people's business. Uh, you get to learn quite intimately about what it is that that's happened in their lives. And to, to be in the presence of people like Jim Lawson, um, uh, I mean, I could go on, the, the, the list is endless, but we can stop because he's a name you know because you've just seen him, uh, to spend time with them uh, and, 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 to, and to examine what they did in, in, in very personal and direct ways is uh, powerful in a way that makes me thankful every day that I'm a filmmaker. What can I say? You know. Well, we thank you for your work. <laughs> You're very Mr. welcome. Hall. Uh, I, you know, in conjunction with all the number of interviews that he's been able, that Mr. York has been able to conduct, um, one of the, the more prominent figures that many of us are aware about is Martin Luther King. How was Martin Luther King Jr. inspired by the teachings and actions of Gandhi? Uh, obviously. Yeah. Martin Luther King was just a little bit older than I am, so I wasn't a confidant of Martin Luther King to know uh, what inspired him in reading it's clear that he did not personally start out to be uh, an activist he was not starting out to be the leader of the American Civil Rights Movement he was a preacher and that's what he wanted to be a minister so much of human history is, as we have heard just this evening, is intertwined with one's religious belief. And I think it's the inspiration for his engagement initially with the civil rights movement. Much has been said today already that suggests <clears throat> that a movement is much like a military campaign. There has to be preparation, there has to be training, there has to be capacity, 
to accomplish it, and one has got to be fairly clear about what the objective is. And I think that is what involved Martin Luther King's interest and pursuit of these tactics, because what was accomplished and achieved by Gandhi freeing an entire culture and country, freeing them from colonial rule, which was kind of the rule for all of the world back then, uh, that that was what he was trying to do here, trying to provide for basic human instincts and requirements freedom, lack of oppression, all of those things that we are now familiar with. And he was influenced like most great leaders of all times. And that is advisors, people who they thought were thoughtful, were intellectual, and he did that. And some of those people were earlier adherence to Mahatma Gandhi's strategies and beliefs. And they had pursued that and invited him to understand what was happening, how it happened, and how it could be used here. Now, what was life like during the civil rights movement? And how has society changed? And what still must be done now, today? York has discussed it. That's a tough question. Uh, I think. I, I think, if the first part of that, I was. I am old enough that I was a college student at Howard University, in the '60s, which was the 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 student years of engagement, the beginning of the student years of engagement, in the civil rights movement, and I've got to tell you that. I probably was not among the most courageous for a long time. Back in those early years, Howard University was not very progressive in the way that it administered education. So as I recall, there was a direct relationship between the number of hours that were in a class, three hours credit, five hours credit, and those would be the number of days you could miss. If you miss more than three for a three-hour course, you automatically failed. If you miss more than five in a five-hour course, you miss five. And our purpose was to go to North Carolina and places like that and get arrested. But I couldn't afford to be locked up for more than three days. I'd fail, and then I would fail with my parents. So I had a, a choice to make, and, and I chose not to antagonize my parents by failing all my classes. So I got locked up one time uh, and then decided I didn't have any more days. Uh, but it was a time for liberation. And there was much debate in that era uh, about whether we should follow the nonviolent doctrine that was advocated by Martin Luther King and some of those who were leading the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other groups like that that were fighting for the same goals. But the question is how you would achieve it. And ultimately, Martin Luther King prevailed, I think. You ask, what, does it, what happens with it today and where does it go? I think it's more difficult to make more clearly what the objectives are in, in a specific way. Uh, pursuit of Equality is noble, but not precise. It is not precise enough, I don't think, for there to be uh, a movement created. It is underpinning of movements, but it's got to be identified. That's what these two films suggested to us. Can you believe it could be about salt, or it could be about a lunch counter? Attaining those goals is specific. The right to vote as part of the civil rights movement is specific. The right to actually practice it, as is the challenge today, is less precise for attacking it in a way that will mobilize a thinking. 
Well, in line with that, 1968 is often cited as a national and global year of activism, and unfortunately a violent interaction between authorities and the public. What lessons were learned then, which can be applied 50 years later, some of which you somewhat addressed, but I think you can it, say it's, that. It's out. difficult, I think, to say because I think it's fair to say that, that the issues are fundamentally the same, but society is a good deal more complex than it was. Uh, it is more clear uh, to say that I ought to have the right to sit at the lunch counter than to try and create the architecture around I ought to have enough money to be able to pay for it. And those issues that are fundamental today are more complex ones. I think, though, that in its root, all of what is embodied by what was demonstrated by Mahatma Gandhi was that, in the end, we have to be clear enough to prevail upon a lot of names for it. I call it human decency. Some people call it soul power. They did soul power, but in, a, in effect, we have got to be able to capture a strategy that changes people's minds, which is what draws the line between violence and nonviolence. We don't have enough guns to make fundamental society change, but we do have the power, as was demonstrated by the two of them, that you can change people's minds. And if you do that, they will change society. What are your thoughts around the various activist movements such as Black Lives Matter and peaceful protests such as the one started by Colin uh, Kaepernick? How effective has it been thus far? I think it's yet to be truly decided. Uh, we live in an age now that is made more complex because of the internet communications opportunity that can pervade, if you call it false news, if you call it alternative facts, all of those things that can invade and pervade people's thinking makes these issues more complicated. Uh, it, personally, it is unclear to me how my decision to kneel for anything can be viewed as anything other than non-violent protests. That is fundamental to the discussion we have just had. Uh, don't call it unpatriotic. I guess it would be if I picked up salt and I wasn't supposed to be. That's unpatriotic. Uh, if I go sit in the lunch counter and the law says that I can't. But I think that kind of protest has to persist if we are to continue the struggle for providing fundamental justice and treatment of those who are disadvantaged. Recognize that that was a protest for police oppression and brutality. In its extreme, police killing is what precipitated that uh, that kind of demonstration. I support it. Uh, I support his right to do it. Uh, I think ultimately, legally, he has a chance to prevail because I think the orchestrated denial of his ability to participate in professional football since then, as an example, is fundamentally uh, a violation of his rights to having protested it. When you speak of uh, the continuation or the need to continue to protest and be uh, highly aware of, of, of causes, how can we inspire young Houstonians from all backgrounds to be more active in their communities? I think first we've got to have just engagement. It's got to be something that relates to them. We've had a distrust created in governmental institutions and processes don't believe that 
their involvement and engagement in those processes changes anything, that it's an effective way to do it. Uh, I think for young people, there's got to be a re-engagement. I have another belief. I believe that the mobility of causes that we now hold revere were really propelled in every case by younger people. We got a lot of names for it, I mean, millennials and all of those fancy names, but we're basically talking about young people. And if you think about it, they were the best that we had produced because they were educated young people. These were not people who were not either in school, just out of school, had provided them with the training, the education, the mind power uh, to lead. And it's probably best asked for me and my generation by people like John Kennedy, who, when I, some people think of things that, some people ask about things and ask why, and others ask about things that never were and ask why not. That is the youth propellant for causing change. And I think that we will find a bigger engagement because of the balance that has to occur or that has occurred in American society. American society I have an abiding faith in because there is a middle sector of American society that has a fundamental belief and adherence to the principles enunciated by this nonviolent strategy for other folks, that there's an extreme, we not call it on the right, an extreme on the left. And if things get too far out of kilter, things are brought back to the center in either direction. And the center is a belief in the human dignity of mankind. And we're in closing our um, panel, I do want to um, ask a question. Um, what do you all believe was Gandhi's biggest contribution to human civilization? If we can just answer that in a short, precise response. I'll be finished quickly. I think uh, that what he has, has taught us is there is such a thing beyond our Sunday school teachings that suggest that it is possible to change an entire society on the belief that love overcomes hate, that the commonality of human beings, he called it for, on a religious basis, pluralism, wasn't a concept I understood until I read about what that was, but we call it tolerance today, I think it's the same thing, but the idea that at its core, all of us aspire to and for the same thing. Mr. York. I can't claim to have understood fully the moral, ethical, and spiritual dimensions of what Gandhi had to say and, and what he taught and practiced, but I, but I am terribly impressed by his understanding of the natures, the nature and the sources of power. We don't think of power as a word that applies terribly. I mean, Gandhi is a, a spiritual man, a saint, and so forth. But, but he did understand power, where it comes from, uh, how to get it, how to use it, um, presumably for a good purpose. Um, but his, I, I would say that m m many of us today could do very well to, to, to re-examine Gandhi's teachings in, in this area. Um, that's all. Mr. Kutori. I know you asked me to be brief, but if you don't mind, just take a moment. <laughs> uh, I'll jump off of uh, what Steve just said. The name of the document itself illustrates a force more powerful, a force that is indomitable, the force that never loses, and that's the force of nonviolence. As uh, Anthony said earlier, is the power of love to overcome. So in my mind, 
the greatest contribution that Mahatma Gandhi ha has made to the world is to show the world a way to settle the conflict without violence. And I'll just go one more minute on briefly on that. And that starts, and if you get a chance, get his autobiography, and in his introduction, there is one paragraph, and I'll be very brief. It says, he has been looking for the absolute truth all his life. He had, he had not found it. And he says, while he's searching for this absolute truth, he must live by relative truth. Relative truth is very simple. No matter who the person is, how old or young, each one of us, on the spot of the moment, decide whether he's right or what is wrong. We don't go consult our holy man or holy book. We make a decision right. So that's my relative truth. So now let's take that one step further. My truth is going to be different from yours. But if I admit it, I don't know the absolute truth, I must respect your belief system, no matter how much I differ from you. So that brings in the tolerance. Then, this is where Gandhi took me, uh, swept me off my feet. And he said, and that is to settle the conflict. It is a matter of time before which you'll come across someone whose belief system is directly opposite from you, what is called a conflict. And he said, there is one and only one way to change the other person's attitude, and that is, I must suffer. And that, at first, is totally contradictory, right? But ask yourself, that's what the film showed. And for real life example, just ask yourself, does not every mother in the world suffer for her children? So love and suffering are two sides of the same coin. So that's, in my mind, is his greatest contribution to the world. Thank you very much. I think now we're going to um, take some questions from the audience. At this time, um, we have two volunteers that are holding microphones. And uh, just a couple things so we can make sure that we get the most um, questions answered that we can. Um, I will select a uh, participant. And when I make the selection, the volunteer will give you the microphone. And at that time, if you don't mind, going straight to your question and then have it as precise as possible so our panelists can provide an answer. And um, Gandhi is supposed to have written that uh, nonviolent method uh, would not work against Hitler and Nazism because they have no conscience. Uh, do you agree with that? And uh, can you expand on it? I would only respond that, and, and maybe one would think a perverted way, uh, what they did is call the rest of the world to end it. That in reality, what they were doing united enough of the rest of the world that they had to oppose it. And I know this is a complicated area because it was resolved, obviously, with arms and war. Uh, but what I think caused people to take up arms, at least it was the feeling I had as a person who had served in the military for some time, was the evil mission that I was charged with fixing. Uh, if I may take a moment on that question, first of all, we need to find the veracity of the statement. I'm not aware of Mahatma Gandhi ever making that statement. However, even if it was to be taken at its face value, one has to remember nonviolence is not a magic bullet. It is not going to work every time. And in audience, we have Acharya Surya Nandaji, who sometimes can explain to all of us that why certain actions are successful and certain are not. There's a lot more to an action and its outcome. They are not always connected. There is a chance that a lot of other issues involved. So let us not assume that nonviolence 
in order to achieve whatever results one want to achieve is a magic bullet. No, it is the other way. The other way is you believe in it. It is not the outcome that is going to determine whether it is right or wrong. It is your belief system. I'll add one other thing if I may. There have been some very, very uh, serious and to my mind credible studies of the use of military action in, in the last 70 years, I believe, the, the study that I think of most frequently in this regard. In the world, whether in revolutionary situations in, in, in Africa or in parts of Asia or, or in, the, in, the, in the Americas, and, and the, the same study looks at both military conflict, whether used to achieve uh, the, the, the removal of an oppressive regime or ruler, and has looked also at nonviolent efforts, opposition and resistance movements, over exactly the same period of time. And the conclusion of, this, of these studies um, is that nonviolent methods are about three times more, more likely to succeed. And I'd be happy to provide you with a reference to, to, to the publications in which these studies appear if you come to me afterward. Yes. Uh, this participant uh, with the suit, um, blue shirt. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation and these great, great um, words of wisdom. It's, it's just wonderful to be here in this country to see this diversity and this expression of different thoughts. It makes me so, so proud to be American and to be with all of you. As an attorney, um, one of my great moments of enlightenment was when I read uh, Gandhiji's biography. Um, and he, he would fast every Monday and go into the silence um, and not speak. And in the, in the biography, he noted that that's when these revelations came to him. And in honor of him, I began fasting every Monday. I can't say I went to the silence. Thank you. Would, would you, uh, Mr. Kotari, if, if you had any more comments about how he achieved this great enlightenment um, by going, by fasting and going into the silence, because I think that could help all of us to hopefully achieve or get closer to God. Thank you. I hope I'm qualified enough to answer your question. Trust me, I'm not, but I'll do my very best. My understanding, and Steve and I, I had dinner last night, and that topic came up. Uh, according to my understanding, the power that Gandhi achieved was through self-purification. See, as a human being, we are born with strengths and weaknesses. And the idea is that if we can improve ourselves, not think bad of anybody, don't have jealousy. So there are lots of factors in, in, one can go into it. Uh, he had 11 vows for anybody who wanted to uh, be in the ashram. And one of the toughest one was Brahmacharya, which is, uh, I'm trying to translate. Right. So. It is a question of self-improvement and how much you can do. And fasting is but one tool that helps you do that. And there are others. And so if you go into that, and that is where, so Gandhiji, for example, was self-reliant. How much do we rely on a lot of other things for our pleasures and so on and so forth? So change our, and I'll give you my own life's example. Just like you are fasting, when I read your autobiography, and he talked about the self-reliance, and this has been quite a few years now, I've been washing my car at home, not taking to the uh, car wash place. Uh, I have been ironing my clothes, okay? Rita is doing that too. But the, ask yourself, what is a small step you can take in your life? It doesn't have to be a big one, okay? Journey of 1,000 miles begins with but one step. So make a start and you never know where you'll end up. Thank you.
the participants, yes. Do you think we as a society of human beings can take um, Gandhi's approach as a world, as the whole world should do is simply because Gandhi and Martin Luther King following um, had a predecessor, which was called Jesus Christ, the nonviolent turn the other cheek. So I was just wondering, do you think that thing that Jesus did a long time ago had anything to do with the fasting and the knowledge coming to Gandhi? Had anything to do with that type of, the same kind of spirit from God? Do you understand it? You can help me. Basically, uh, the spirit, I guess, in which Jesus um, came in the form of God uh, to be able to m move forward. And uh, did, did, did Gandhi, did that have any influence on the way Gandhi was able to perform? Uh, well, I shouldn't say perform, but, but move forward in nonviolent. Uh, the major influences on Mahatma Gandhi, as I understand, First of all, was the Indian scripture, Bhagavad Gita. He followed it till the day he died, and he would look up to it for any reference he has. In terms of the mention of the Jesus Christ, is a phenomenal example of the nonviolence that as he was being crucified, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not a practicing Christian, that forgive those, they know not what they are doing. So when Mahatma Gandhi went to Paris and went to Notre Dame, and when he saw Jesus Christ for the first time crucifixion there, he cried. So it's a great example, but uh, you know, so there's a lot of similarity. So the other influence was, I do not know how many of you read The Kingdom of God is Within You by Leo Tolstoy. The whole book is written on uh, resist no evil with force. So that also had an influence on Mahatma Gandhi. And he was very happy to see that it was not only his belief system that's in nonviolence, but there are examples in the rest of the world that also adhere to the same principle. One, one more question. We'll take the participant up front. I think this may be our last question. Thank you for this. When I look around the world, um, I don't see a very promising future about nonviolent people. They usually get shot in the head or nailed to the cross or be put in the jail for 27 years. I want to live and enjoy life as a millennial or a young person. I believe that when you have strength, you can actually sometimes deter um, people like the Nazis or people who can colonize you. Uh, do you think nonviolence is something which we all should follow because I see India, it's broken into nine countries and they are fighting and having 32 active or passive conflicts. So I, I t prove it to me that nonviolence works every time. I, I've seen the studies, but I see millions dying by people just surrendering in the name of nonviolence. Thank you. You, you raise obviously some very profound questions, and this can sound extreme, but societies have, since the beginning of time, gone to war with the realization that they could die. These are movements as profound as those that cause folks to go to war. One of the principles that was enunciated, I think, in both the film and others was a demonstration for us that there had to be enough commitment that you understood that you were putting yourself at risk for life and limb. Certainly, Gandhi Streck presented that to us. They were aware that that was potentially a consequence. So I think in the end, it's a question of the commitment to that cause that we are pursuing. I do know in my own history, in the civil rights movement, there were people who realized that what they were doing risked, it, risked life and limb. 
but it was just that important for them and the cause, that cause, to be free. I would approach it from a slightly different angle and perhaps the answer is the same. As I believe, all of us are on an ego trip. And the example I'd like to give you, the larger the ego trip, the larger the buildings and so on and so forth. So if you were to take a survey today of how many people know Nelson Rockefeller, I guarantee you the number of people who know them today would be much less than during 50s. And Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos that we know of today, you ask 100 years from now and there'll be another Bill Gates, another Jeff Bezos. However, you take the same survey and ask the people, how many people know Muhammad? How many people know Jesus Christ? How many people know Buddha? How many people know Gandhi? How many people know Mahavir, Krishna, Ram, etc.? You go and go on and on. I believe the survey will show roughly the same number of people who know them. So they have achieved the ultimate ego trip of immortality. So when somebody wants to be rich, they study the autobiography of Bill Gates. I'll do this, this is what he did. Well, if the ultimate ego trip is immortality, then we'll have to study the examples of these people and ask ourselves how we can emulate. So violence and non-violence uh, non have, as uh, Steve had said earlier, have coexisted from the day one of the humanity. It's not going to go away. We always reminisce and old days are good, but trust me, those people who are there, like, you know, they were thinking the same thing. So our children today think this is a great world, but when they grow up and they see how it works, they say, oh my God, what's going on here? So that would be my suggestion in terms of adhering to the nonviolence. I just wanted to, referring back to a question, maybe two questions back, Sometimes I don't have an answer right away, but if I think about it for a minute or two, I'll, I'll, I'll have an idea, and that's what's happened in this situation. Um, as a result of making these films, I've been in contact, we've been contacted, I've been contacted, my, my colleagues and I've been contacted by people around the world in countries that are not free. Let's put it that way. We're talking about Zimbabweans, Venezuelans, um, many people in, in many parts of the world who will say, They'll call or send an email and say they'd like to do something like this. They'd like to lead a movement which will remove Robert Mugabe, for example. Um, and, but then they'll go on in the very next breath and they'll say, but of course, we don't have a Gandhi in our country. We don't have a Martin Luther King, so it's really hopeless. Well, I don't know how I can help when someone makes a statement like that. But the, the thing that I do say is that there have been many examples of successful, quote, revolutions or whatever you want to call it, in which there was no charismatic leader. There was no spiritual leader. There was a unity around a cause, around an objective which enough people felt was right and fair and worth fighting for, with or without a charismatic leader. It helps but you don't have to have it. Thanks. And this is plugging for uh, Steve's documentary. The last example episode in the documentary is how Chile removed uh, General Pinochet, and there was no particular leader, and it was just the people coming together, so I just want to add that in. And before we finish, I just want to say my personal thanks to the, uh, to the Asia Society Texas Center and to the Gandhi Library for holding this event. Thank you. Thanks for Agent Society being able to host this event. Um, unfortunately, we um, have come to a point that we will be ending the program. And uh, thanks again for the Gandhi Library um, as well. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we're not just done yet. Uh, my name is Manish Wani. I'm on the uh, board at the Mahatma Gandhi Library. Uh, and it's uh, 
really a distinct honor to be the last speaker just before or just after a great uh, panel discussion and just before a warm reception that we have for you guys outside. But uh, just uh, really bear with me just for about 10 minutes uh, as hopefully what I have to share with you will be enlightening and informative. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge our panel uh, on behalf of the Mahatma Gandhi Library. Uh, let's uh, acknowledge our moderator, Dr. Carla Bailey. And this is a token of uh, appreciation. Uh, of course, Mr. Steve York, the producer of the film. Thank you. Thank you. And then the Honorable Captain Anthony Hall. And then lastly, uh, really the person that's been behind this, uh, uh, putting this all together, and that's uh, Ms. Selena Jaffrey of Texas uh, Asia Society. She has been a pleasure to work with. So, uh, and, I, and I know we're uh, running out of time, but uh, yeah. Oh, here's Selena right here. There she is. All right. Thank you so much, Selena. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, moving on, what I wanted to talk to you about briefly is really the Mahatma Gandhi Library and our initiatives. Uh, we're a small organization of just a few volunteers. We started in 2012. And of course, with our title, the question always begs, where is the Mahatma Gandhi Library? And so uh, humbly we have to reply, we don't really have a library per se. And in this day and age, we can get away with saying, well, but we do have a website. So you uh, visit our website and you'll see what we're doing. Uh, again, it's a small organization our, uh, of a few volunteers, and our mission is simple. It's to increase the public awareness of Gandhi's legacy and to promote the values of peace, truth, and nonviolence. And um, we've been doing this for the past many years uh, through various activities, especially for kids that involve, uh, and they really are, evolve around uh, the celebration of Gandhi Jayanti, which is Gan Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And that's, of course, upcoming on October 2nd. We hold a variety of student contests. We display the Gandhi Darshan exhibit, which is, which is a display of his actual photographs, and it portrays the life and times of Mahatma Gandhi. And we've uh, uh, displayed this in a variety of places in Houston, including the University of Houston, the, the Downtown Public Library, uh, and many other places. Now, the annual birthday celebration, which Atul Bhai just uh, briefly mentioned, includes a 5K walk for peace, and this uh, has been occurring annually over at Herman Park, where Houstonians gather each year to vote for peace using their legs. The walk then kicks off the Thousand Lights for Peace program, and this, this is done at the beautiful Miller Outdoor Theater, where the awards to our student contest winners are given, and the crowd is delighted to an international multicultural program. And throughout the years, we've had some amazing guest speakers, including our own consul generals, uh, Mattress Mack, Mayor Bill White, Sheila Jackson Lee, and many, many other, others. But the highlight of the program is really where everyone in attendance gets to light a candle as their pledge for peace. It's truly an amazing sight that I know many of you have enjoyed for the past several years, and I invite you guys personally, October 14th at Miller Outdoor Theater, we're going to have this again, and this will be for celebrating his 149th birthday. Again, more details are, our web, uh, are at our website at thegandhilibrary.org. Some of the other things we do is in the month of January, we have been commemorating Mahatma Gandhi's uh, Shraddhanjali, which is a memorial tribute, and we do this in collaboration with our friends at Unity of Houston. And also on a monthly basis, it's a small but dedicated group of volunteers. We meet to discuss Gandhiji's autobiography, the story of my experiments with truth. It's a book that I would undoubtedly recommend for, your, for everyone's collection. And reading that book certainly has been cha life-changing for me, for me. So again, we are a small group. But we were very satisfied with what we were accomplishing, reaching out to the community, keeping in mind our simple mission to promote the values of peace and truth and nonviolence. But as many, if not all organizations, there's always this one person who just can't get enough and they're unable to keep in check their enthusiasm, their passion, and their vision for what they firmly so believe in. 
You know, in grade schools, we used to refer to these people as, you know, they have ants in their pants because they're always just moving and shaking. And, of course, for us, it's uh, our founder and our true leader, Mr. Atul Qatari. And it was just about, yeah, let's give him a big round of applause. And it was just about 12 months ago, he had this vision of the upcoming Mahatma Gandhi's 150th sesquicentennial birthday. And after our small uh, sort of volunteers, we finally agreed on how to just spell the word. It took us a long time to even pronounce sesquicentennial, but we got through it. Mr. Qatari said, let's have a year-long celebration across the city of Houston, and let's get all these organizations involved and get all these high-profile, powerful people involved as if you know, they don't have enough things to do. And sure enough, before we knew it, we had a website up. Uh, we formed an incredible advisory board, uh, which is chaired by none other than Miss Ann Chow of Asia Society. And we have a who's who's list of many of the leaders of this great city, representing many of the prominent organizations. And, and this would be a good time to specifically recognize one of the organizations that has been sort of the, uh, the, the, the they've, uh, they've really taken the Mahatma Gandhi Library uh, with, under their wings with open arms, and that's the Arya Samaj, uh, led by uh, Mr. Dev Mahajan, who's in, in the off with us today. I'd also like to recognize one of their true devotees, who's also an inspirational musician and teacher, Ms. Smriti Srivastava, uh, who I've been told is uh, responsible for filling up the auditorium today. So, and as the coordinator of this campaign, Mr. Ajit Paralkar, uh, earlier explained, there is a whole lot going on in this city for the next year. Uh, and so please take uh, the opportunity to visit the website, Gandhi150.us, and really look at what, what you may be interested in. I mean, something like this, again, can only come across uh, every 150 years. Now, if this was not enough, uh, for our small organization. Mr. Kotari recently just came back from India, and somehow he made personal contacts with the Birla family in Delhi. And for those of you who don't know, the Birla, the Birla family are like the Nelson Rockefellers of India. It's kind of like me going to California and uh, knocking on Elon Musk's door and uh, asking him for a replica of, the, of this patented battery he uses to drive all the, uh, to make all his Tesla cars. So Mr. Kotari comes back after the visit in India, and I want to show you this video he, uh, he uh, shows, or he uh, shows the, uh, the uh, Gandhi Library. Welcome to Eternal Gandhi, Shashwat Gandhi, located at Gandhi Smriti, also known as Birla House in New Delhi. Eternal Gandhi is one of the world's first digital multimedia museums on Mahatma Gandhi's life and deeds. The museum not only documents, but also revives the values by which India obtained freedom. Multiple exhibits of museum extrapolate Gandhian ideals into newer domains of interest, information technology and product design. Mahatma Gandhi had spent six years and ten months in prison during his lifetime. This installation enables you to recall the scenes of Gandhi's life in prison through three interactive pods. At the heart of the museum, it stands as Gandhiji's pillar of truth, the stump. Eleven rotatable discs spin around the axis. The turning of the prayer wheel triggers off a visual representation of Mahatma Gandhi's 11 vows stipulated for the Satyagrahis. The Ashram Story Mahatma Gandhi had founded ashrams in both South Africa and India. The ashram stands as an embodiment of truth. It was his concept of a house without the boundaries of caste, creed or religion. Timeline Browser the act of walking alongside a wall is transformed into a retrieval device. It unfolds images and events from Mahatma Gandhi's life as a social revolutionary to his search for spiritual enlightenment. Historic archival footage, photographs and interviews with eminent scholars and Gandhians create an information mosaic. Apart from the exhibits and installation, the museum houses Gandhiji's room, where he used to stay while in Delhi, he had spent his last days in this very house. 
The museum is designed keeping children at the central focus. This is the only of its kind museum where all multimedia interactive technology is applied to educate children on truth, non-violence, love and service. Houston is soon going to host the only edition of Eternal Gandhi in USA. The mission of this museum is to provide field trips to children to this multimedia exhibition and believe me children will push their parents to take them there. So, you know, we at the Gandhi Library, we were just floored with this idea, this mind-boggling concept, an eternal Gandhi museum in Houston, Texas. Well, before you know it, uh, a three-acre parcel of land has been purchased, and this is on Beltway 8 and uh, 59. Architectural renderings have already been made, display displaying a beautiful 10,000-square-foot facility to house these exhibits and to provide a venue which will offer, offer a place of spiritual gatherings and dialogue, field trip opportunities for school children citywide, and really a must place see for all Houstonians and visitors. I have been told that the 11 exhibits that have been donated by the Birla family have now reached Houston and are just awaiting the erection of this museum. So needless to say, uh, we are truly excited about this opportunity and, and feel that this museum will add a jewel to the already amazing crown the city of Houston displays. So to learn more details about the museum, be, please do uh, visit outside. We have some pictures and displays and volunteers uh, who can answer some questions. Uh, keep your eyes and ears open uh, for the upcoming uh, year. And I think with that, my 10 minutes are up. Uh, I want to thank, again, each one of you for spending this uh, uh, afternoon with us for a wonderful kickoff event to this year-long Gandhi celebration. Uh, on behalf of Asia Society and the Mahatma Gandhi Li Library, we will conclude the program and invite you to join us for a warm reception outside. Thank you all once again.